participants joined. Great, let's um, kick off the discussion here today. So welcome everyone. Uh, this is a Carrero sponsored webinar about offering DDoS protection as a service. I'm really looking forward to today's uh, discussion. Uh, we've invited several service providers from across the spectrum uh, to participate in today's, today's discussion. Uh, Carrero um, uh, has been around for uh, 10 years in the DDoS space and I've been involved with them all that time. And one of the things uh, our products do is uh, function as a service enabling technology for our provider customers. So today we invited an audience um, who are in the business of being service <laughs> providers and offer value added services to their customers. In particular, today's topic is DDoS. So uh, let's uh, kick off the, the, the show here. Uh, we invited uh, Eric Nordquist from GTT, uh, Steve Johnston from Open Cape, and Eric Brett Howe from First Light. Um, welcome, welcome folks. Thanks for joining us today. Mm, uh, thanks maybe, for having uh, us. Great. Welcome. Well, maybe we'll go around the table and you can briefly introduce yourselves. Uh, Eric Norquist, you want to start? Sure. My name is Eric Norquist. I am the uh, Global Managed Security Product Director here at GTT. Say that five times fast. Uh, <laughs> GTT is a global company. Uh, we operate a tier one internet network and provide a comprehensive suite of cloud and networking and managed solutions uh, that utilize advanced software to find networking and security technologies. Uh, we serve thousands of businesses in the mid and enterprise size markets and across most verticals. Uh, we like to brag here at GTT that we see one third of the world's internet traffic traverse the GTT network. Uh, we like to say that we make the exceptional possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally handle all of our managed security solutions, including but not limited to our managed firewall and security, managed SASE, our managed detection and response, and of course, managed DDoS protection. Uh, given that we are in the business of uptime, um, this was a natural fit for us to offer. So thanks for having me. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, over to you, Steve. Would you like to introduce yourself, sure. please? Good, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Steve Johnston. I'm the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of Open Cape. Uh, we service, we're a 100% fiber optic network and ISP servicing uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, the islands, uh, Nantucket, and uh, Martha's Vineyard, as well as approximately 38 uh, communities in southeastern Massachusetts. Uh, we have about 550 miles of fiber that connects in Providence, Rhode Island, and Boston, Massachusetts. And we um, we service primarily uh, a smaller version of uh, Eric and his friends at GTT. We actually do work with GTT, uh, but we service enterprise level, municipal, uh, large business, small business, and we are um, sticking our toe into the fiber to the home uh, market. We're doing some pilots currently across our, our footprint. Uh, we're odd in the space in the sense that we are uh, uh, being a telecommunications company and ISP, we are also uh, a not-for-profit. So we operate with a different agenda versus uh, other folks in the space. And we, uh, we do offer Carrero to uh, current DDoS mitigation to all of our customers, um, um, whether they choose to utilize it or not. So okay. I'll talk more about that later. Glad to be here. Thanks, Steve. And uh, Eric, over to you at uh, First Light. Howdy, my name's Eric Brethauer. I'm a tier three engineer here at First Light Fiber Inc. Uh, we are a, about a 30,000 fiber mile ISP tier two. Uh, we're in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, a little bit of Massachusetts as well. Um, we uh, picked up Carrero DDoS about a little under a year ago after a, uh, a very large product search to offer a 100 gig clean return DDoS solution to protect our customers. Great, thanks, Eric. Welcome. So as you see on the diagram here, I've just illustrated it, uh, global tier ones, uh, regional tier two, and uh, local or, or smaller region uh, tier threes. Um, this model reproduces itself around the world, of course. So 
Uh, today we're focused on North America, but we ha we've had similar customer experiences uh, in Europe uh, and in Asia Pac. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, the the requirements and the customer needs, and of course the malicious DDoS attacks, are pretty much the same worldwide. So while the language might be different or the currency uh, might be different. Um, the fundamentals of offering DDoS protection as a service, uh, in my experience across dozens of dozens and dozens of uh, instances, uh, seem very similar. So let's dig in a bit and just uh, let me set the scene with uh, the DDoS as a business risk. What we find around the globe is that uh, you know being subject to DDoS attacks can lead to service downtime. That's probably the worst uh, uh, immediate outcome, but it can also impact in different ways, service level agreement failures or poor performance, um, unpredictable uh, behavior. Uh, that can result in customers of providers, your customers to the provider audience uh, today, um, having trouble. Your brand can be damaged, their brand can be damaged. Uh, you may lose them as a customer if you don't provide a good quality service uh, for, the, for the internet side of things, or they may lose their customers if they can't stay up and running to deliver their value. And ultimately, you know, you can account for that. So you see various numbers in the journals or analyst reviews um, uh, as to the amount of revenue impact is generally considered as with many of the cybersecurity threats uh, to be um, uh, larger than the cost of being proactive and protecting your networks. And what we find these days too, is that DDoS remains in the top five cybersecurity threats that enterprises and businesses are looking at. Uh, obviously breach, ransomware, hijacking, data exfiltration um, are amongst that group too. So it, it gets attention. What, what happens when we offer through, these, through our, cust our customers, DDoS protection as a service, uh, companies get to reduce their risk, um, downtime is avoided, uh, SLAs are met, and that continuous service that they need for their, their customers, their clients, if it's institutional, um, their citizens, if it's a hospital, their patients, et cetera, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, uh, all gets uh, preserved. In terms of the industry trends on DDoS, we track them every year, our uh, threat intel report, well, last year will be coming out shortly with a lot more detail, but it's it's been a continuous situation that each year attacks become harder to detect. Um, perhaps the latest innovation by the bad guys is carpet bombing, uh, harder to mitigate, uh, more sophisticated, uh, impacting DNS or I, even now IPv6 attacks are showing up. So. This is not something that's going to go away. It's recognized by customers up and down the spectrum, and therefore it's driving increased interest and demand for uh, DDoS protection as a service. So let's get back to our panelists. And um, when, we're, when we at Carrero are talking to uh, our provider customers and prospects, uh, we often uh, visualize it as a journey, a DDoS maturity journey. We still do meet providers around the world who don't have any explicit protection for DDoS. Uh, they handle it uh, like on a case-by-case -case emergency basis, usually with humans. But um, obviously today we're talking to a group of providers who are much further along on that journey. Uh, they've actually um, progressed to selling DDoS protection as a service to their clients or customers. So, so with that, maybe we'll uh, go around the table and uh, maybe I'll start with you, Steve. Um, what what was it? Uh, do you remember what it was that first uh, motivated OpenCape to uh, to look at offering DDoS protection as a service to their customers or to your customers? Sure, it was. Uh, you know, we connect about ninety five percent of the schools uh, in our footprint, um, yeah. which is great, and um, uh, we had lots of occurrences of DDoS attacks that mirrored many of the screens you showed earlier. Um, um, not huge attacks, but frequent, short duration, um, really causing problems for our end client. And, and while we could address them in a, you know, um, in an indirect manner with a black holing their traffic, that wasn't the ideal solution. 
Uh, so looking at, you know, we went out and looked at all the different options in the marketplace. Uh, and for us, you know, we, uh, um, uh, we really liked the availability of putting the inline devices at our edge in Boston and in Providence. And um, that reduced, you know, any sort of delay regarding latency um, on our net and going up to the cloud. Uh, we, we usually, the, the network itself operates with little to no net latency uh, at OpenCAPE. So that part wasn't too much of a concern, but um, that was the, the initial um, uh, demand Great. from customers that kind of prompted us to take action. Great, thanks. And over to you, Eric, at GTT. I know you guys have been offering the service of probably in its fourth year or maybe maybe even fifth year now. Um, uh, from a global perspective, much bigger network. Um, you know what 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 do you see as the as the big big driver for a tier one to offer this kind of protection? Sure. Well, what drove us initially uh, to you know put DDoS protection on our network is uh, like many providers to protect the core network ourselves, protect ourselves. And then once we did that, you know, we looked to say, well, let's share that value with customers. Um, we're in the uptime business. We want to make sure our circuits are up and available. We offer other products to provide uptime to customers, you know, beyond internet connectivity, there's 4G backup, SD-WAN, et cetera. Uh, protection from DDoS attacks was an obvious fit in, in, in that discussion, right? So we wanted to take advantage and share the, take advantage of the large tier one network that we have and our global reach. Uh, we do that with 10 global scrubbing centers. So it really was the next obvious step past, you know, the initial need of, hey, let's make sure our internal uh, systems are protected against these type of attacks, because we certainly were seeing those. So. Great. Yeah. And that, that sort of signifies that move from the, the third level of this diagram up to the top there. Quite a lot of providers do start with infrastructure protection for themselves first before they migrate to offer uh, the service. Uh, uh, as a paid service for their customers. How about first light, uh, Eric? Were you? I know you're on the technical side, but were you involved in the um, the uh, you know discussions and decisions to uh, offer DDoS protection as a service, or were you dealing with it before you had? Uh, uh, oh, I don't know what to make. I've been at first light. I've been at first light about 15 months now. Okay. Uh, when I started, uh, they had an existing system. I don't know. Can we say other vendors who we had? Just say other vendors for now, but <laughs> okay. So we had a we had a couple other vendors uh, that previous engineers had uh, built a system, um, and we had a lot of issues with it. Uh, it was it just seemed like every time you know we turned around, a uh, customer would be have too much traffic flowing. It would cause a false detection, and then their their good known good traffic would be being mitigated. So we'd have to come up with all these special rules to bypass. Um, as well uh, with the appliances that we had, uh, you know there was a lot of a lot more pieces and facets to it. I guess I could say um, there was transport involved. Um, it, it was it was just a, a an aged and you know dated solution that we had. So um, one of the, the one of the first big product projects that I had when I came on board was to you know I guess evaluate all the vendors out there. So I met with every big company you know in the DDoS market that there was, and they did want to resell it as a service as well as uh, protect our own infrastructure internally. Um, because we are a very remote company also, like I think a lot of companies are, you know, much more remote nowadays than they used to be. So that was a, a huge, you know, I guess, caveat to the whole piece of the puzzle. Um, I can leave it there or I can go right. a lot yeah. more to debt. That's good. So um, when, um, when it's back to you, Steve. So uh, when you rolled out the service, uh, um, I know that uh, uh, Carrero, obviously provides a, a sort of turnkey program to get you up and running and get you uh, uh, providing this service. Uh, was that, can you describe the take up on your side? I think you might have mentioned that you offer it sort of pretty much to all of your customers. And so is it built into your <laughs> overall value proposition to your to your client base then? We talked about that. We talked about, you know, as a, as a mission-driven organization who 
likes yeah. making money and reinvesting that money back into our network. Um, we talked about all the different options. We talked about offering it as a paid service. We talked about offering it for free to all our customers for, for addressing some of the issues that uh, Eric mentioned, you know, the health of our network and health of customers. But ultimately, we decided to subsidize it significantly, but actually charge a fee to customers uh, based on the, the volume of bandwidth they take us. So we really rolled it out to our core areas that we were seeing uh, they were being targeted, you know, okay. uh, hospitals, municipalities, schools, those type of areas, and rolled it up there first. And then there's like a proportional charge baked back it into is. their it's, service. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, they're you know they pay a very small fee, uh, yeah. literally you know on a per gig basis, yeah. uh, hundreds of dollars, which is yeah. next to nothing. I think I mentioned uh, one of our customers. Um, um, they were a larger municipality mm -hmm. and they said, oh, they were getting charged something like $27,000 uh, a year uh, by their previous provider. And when they, when he came over to the, the town that he was working at now, uh, we were providing better service uh, via Carrero and they were paying just over $5,000 a year. So uh, he was super happy with everything. Yeah. So that gives you an example. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, back to you, Eric, at GTT. So uh, how about with that? I'm not looking very, you know, sharing any competitive information here, but how do you decide on how to price it and offer it to your customers? Is it, is it uh, optional, always on, or, you know, uh, premium service or regular? What, what's what's the GTT sure. story? So um, the, the DDoS protection service already existed. I'm relatively new here, uh, under 12 months still here already. Uh, it, it already existed as a service when I came, but we recently did upgrade the service. Uh, even before I got here, there were different variations that had happened. And I think that's important. We may or may not talk about this later in terms of if you want to implement a DDoS protection service for your customers, uh, go in with what you think is the best solution would be my advice. Um, but be prepared to adapt because you just never know you're going to have different customers come at you and eventually you'll start seeing trends in terms of what customers want. Um, you know, so when we kind of relaunched the service here at GTT, we updated our service definitions and we, we tried to improve our SLAs, which is very important these days because mm -hmm. the space is getting more competitive and I'm sure Carrera sees that as well. Um, the good news is, is Carrera was there with me uh, the whole time to get me up to speed on how things worked. Uh, I came from a DDoS technical background, so it, you know it, it wasn't that hard. But Carrera was great at getting me informed uh, and basically talk with me and how he can effectively show all the value of a managed DDoS protection service. Uh, DDoS protection is not the most sexy type of managed service out there, uh, but it is very important. And sometimes I think uh, in the market, we tend to gloss over some things that we take for granted. And I think it's important to talk about all the different aspects uh, of DDoS protection that, that it's provided. Just things like hosting the infrastructure. We know what a challenge that can be for uh, customers just to upgrade uh, existing systems, whether or not they're firewalls or phone systems or whatever, um, just to take that type of uh, those ban hours away so they don't have to worry about it and then have peace of mind that they're always protected 24 seven. These are the type of things that we wanna be talking about when we, we talk about this type of service uh, to really show the value. And when you can really speak to the value, uh, really customers are, are prepared to, to sign up. It's like, hey, you know, I would love to pay you to make this problem go away. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Great, thank you. And at first like Eric, so do you, um... Uh, how, do, do all of your customers uh, take the service or is it a select few or, you know, is it the ones that are, are, are under attack that take it? How does it, how does it work out in the first light case? Um, we, we designed it a little bit differently. Um, yeah. So obviously, you know, we kind of had a duty to protect, you know, our, our overall infrastructure. Yep. So yes, everyone gets it kind of. The thresholds are different. So in other words, if you're, you know, if a, a two gig attack comes in and you've got a bunch of gigabit customers, um, obviously they're gonna feel that pinch from the attack. Um, but we also resell it as a service. It's uh, turned out to be more profitable than, you know, anybody 
had imagined. And this is, you know, per my sea level guys. Um, so we do resell it. And, uh, you know, we've had exceptionally good uh, responses from our customers who had our previous DDoS implementation. Um, the amount of uh, visibility that they have now has increased incredibly. Uh, they're much happier with the service now that we have since we've migrated from the old solution. So you can, we sell it as a service, but we also use it to our benefit to protect our infrastructure as well, voice networks. Um, if you're not familiar with First Light, we have a pretty large portfolio of data centers uh, yeah. and things like that. So we use it, you know, in, in a lot of ways to protect our organization um, as well as reselling it to give customers a lot of visibility into um, their protection as well. That's good. Uh, so I would, uh, how, uh, again, taking advantage of uh, representatives from different tiers of the industry here, where, where does, I was interested, where does DDoS protection as a service fit in your selling cycle? Is it something that you, you, know, you mentioned up front or is it something that customers ask for through an RFP? Or you know, uh, or all of the above. I mean, maybe just qu a quick. Uh, where, do you have a feeling for where it is in your sales cycle, Steve? Is it? Is it? We talk about center? it. We yeah. talk about it like right off the get go. We might not okay. lead with that, you know, because yep. it's um, you know obviously we're we're in the business of connecting people, but it yep. is in that very first discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, we use it as a huge selling point and a huge sweetener to differentiate ourselves against our primary competition which in these markets are is comcast so yeah okay good. and how about you eric at uh, gtt do you know where it comes in the selling cycle is it specific customers who ask for it or is it offered to everybody at, at some stage or i'd say Very previously it was more specific customers asking for it okay but we've taken yep. the approach now though uh, again because it is a natural extension of our internet services yep. Uh, we, we try to look at it as an easy add-on. We've mm -hmm. kind of talked about our story here at GTT of a protected internet, which mm -hmm. tries to differentiate just your classic, you know, internet connectivity with uh, a service that's, uh, you know, can guarantee more uptime. So nowadays we really try to position both together and oftentimes we'll just position it as part of our internet services. And oftentimes if customer really doesn't see the value of those and say that that's fine, but we don't want that aspect, but we really are trying to position it as part of our core service. Great, and, and Eric, at first, like you were mentioning customers see the value, was that um, when they were, uh, you know, offered it or did they ask for it? Do you, do you recall Do you recall how it comes up in your sales process? I'm an engineer. Good answer. <laughs> no idea. You, I, I, how no, I, I know agree, I agree. How there's more, you know, how I know that there's, you know, so much pos positive response with it is because I work with our repair center and those yeah. guys are the ones that actually talk to the customers. Yeah. Um, I don't deal with customers at all, guys. I I I, th I think you add to your credibility when you say that rather than making something up, uh, Eric. So I'm not really amusing. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Uh, let's let's uh, let's talk also about the kind of customers. I think Steve mentioned, I, and I just you know showing a spectrum here. This is not uh, created for this audience or whatever. I just know we just know from our history of you know ten years in DDoS that uh, um, all of these are potential targets. And I can imagine depending on the size of the provider that the mix the mix varies. So um, uh, you mentioned schools were an early adopter. Schools and educational institutions were an early adopter. Steve. Are there other are there other sectors or verticals shown on this chart that uh, uh, fall in your in your uh, customer customer target or customer base? Yeah, I mean we we touch all these um, maybe not the downstream ISP providers. Well, yeah. actually, even that no, we do do that as well. Um, we we have every one of these segments as customers currently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of them in different different levels, but certainly every one of these uh, hospital systems, schools. Financial government. Uh, we're one of the primary providers of Joint Base Cape Cod, which has been in the news a lot recently. Um, yeah. um, so, uh, uh, but all these actually, absolutely, all these sectors are part mm -hmm. of our DDoS mm -hmm. deployments. 
Yeah. And how about how about first sight? I, I know your regional uh, coverage. Does that drop you into any one of these particular types of customers, Eric? Do you see that at your level of the network, or are they, actually, all, are they all bits and bytes to you? Uh, we have all of what you have listed, okay. um, and uh, I will say that I I believe that primarily um, our main customers for DDoS now are school systems, colleges, um, and hospitals. Yeah. So that's the, those are the, the kind of the biggest, you know, bulk of our DDoS, you know, services that we sell. Yeah. I, I think I can, I think I can add a little insight there too, from looking, thinking of the customers we have around the globe, um, institutions like that, you know, where they have a budget to deliver, an important service like education or healthcare, um, they're not going to have the resources uh, to have around the clock, you know, security, cybersecurity staff. We all know how hard cybersecurity resources are to, to find um, and retain uh, in, in the current market. Um, also, you know, the level of expertise needed is not core to their business or their mission. So they're very much are more likely to work with one of their existing trusted infrastructure providers like their internet service provider and just layer on top of that the um the you know the protection that ddos can can provide uh, how, from the global point of view eric uh, gtt um do you see all I, I assume you see all of these segments is that is that right yeah uh, and a big chunk of them will be the the downstream isps yeah, of course. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, two, I'll speak yeah. to yeah, and I'll yeah, speak to ahead. education though, because yeah. uh, a previous company where I was at, I was the person actually doing the DDoS mitigations. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, before I, you know, went into product and half into sales, uh, the dark side, as it were. But mm -hmm. uh, when I was actively doing mitigations, at least for, with the company I was at previously, ninety percent of the DOS, DDoS attacks that we saw were mm -hmm. against school systems. Uh, it was interesting because during summer months, uh, DDoS got really quiet. And then yeah. there would always be a time, I remember anecdotally, that we'd start seeing a bunch of DDoS attacks. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, it must be August because schools are back in session. And we'd mm. definitely be seeing that. Mm. Uh, and, and around finals time in, in December, it was like you could almost set your clock to it. But mm. obviously, um, data center type customers, hosting providers are, are, are key as well. There's, you know, some of the top hitters that are going to see the most attacks. Yeah. Uh, the ch the challenge from offering DDoS as a service beyond those the low hanging fruit, the 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 people that obviously know they need this protection uh, mm -hmm. and are willing to pay for it is is trying to talk to customers that may not necessarily see the value, or they see the value and don't necessarily have the budget. Uh, mm -hmm. Is trying to speak to those customers and, and often yeah. and what we did here at GTT. Uh, I, I realized I didn't answer this question before is we, we offer an always on service uh, uh, until okay. recently. And then we added a, a, what I would call kind of a lower tier to target mm -hmm. smaller customers. Again, that yes, they understand the value, but didn't necessarily have the budget. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we instituted more of a detect and divert type of uh, approach instead of the premium always on. And because mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in giving customers options uh, yep. And so we really had the, you know, we, we were looking at the numbers and, and really targeted that as a potential opportunity here. So that's a new release for us. And I'm curious to see how it plays out, especially with, again, our approach of really trying to provide DDoS protection with any of our uh, access services that we sell. Yeah, that's cool. Um, you know, thinking of the audience, uh, this this uh, discussion, uh, we've, we've been chatting now for 30 minutes, was intended to... Uh, you know, to your peer provide pro, pro, other providers around the world. Are there any sort of like uh, tips or takeaways you you'd share um, with the uh, with your peers uh, when they're thinking of uh, offering you know DDoS protection as a service based on your your direct experiences? Yeah, I'll I'll start with that. So yeah, go, I mean, I, I kind of, I kind of already touched on them a, a little bit already, but. Um, you know, be prepared to do different service levels. If you're going to get into the space, you know, trust your gut, uh, but be prepared to adjust, you know, to what you're seeing in, in feedback from customers. And that, that's what we did here at GTT. We had uh, many more flavors initially, which was boiled down to one premium always on service. And then we recently expanded 
to kind of to to go for a uh, smaller tier type of customers. So you know, all of our customers are different sizes and shapes and and verticals, et cetera. So we really had to adjust over time. So I guess that would be my tip is uh, just be prepared to adjust um, what you might build in the beginning may not be what you end up with, uh, but just be prepared to kind of adjust to what your customers uh, requirements are. Yeah, good point. And of course, the um, the uh, all I, I didn't mention it at the time, but I, I believe all of uh, uh, your solutions take advantage of the uh, the customer facing portal service portal and these as you mentioned eric these different service configurations are possible all on top of the same te technical infrastructure you know it's really how you choose to use it and offer it that uh, and, and the way it's integrated into your own networks because so here on premise means on network in in this case here too that's cool. I would say um, uh, one of the things what, that all the providers here can differentiate ourselves from some of the cloud providers is the fact that this protection would be on network versus yeah. a cloud provider has to divert to their scrubbing center. That means added latency, uh, complex yeah. GRE tunnels to get the traffic yeah. back. Yeah. That's a story yeah. we try to tell here at GTT, yeah. along with being a tier one and our, our large capacity you know, to defend against yeah. large uh, scale attacks. So, yeah. Yeah. Actually, across uh, across this spectrum of customers, for example, in your case, Steve or or, or Eric at First Light, do you think you are the only provider of DDoS protection for these clients? Typically, Steve? In, in some of our larger clients, you know, the, cl the clients we may be providing multiple ten gig circuits or fifty or a hundred gigs or yeah. more. Um, yeah. They're more sophisticated. They get it. They have multiple, um, maybe. Um, we might be the primary or they may have something yeah. in-house for the smaller downstream clients, you know, that they may have one or two IT people on their staff, uh, very much like Eric just said, having multiple flavors of the yeah. service. And in some of those cases, you know, we actually do let them feel a little pain if they're mm -hmm. not the one who's subscribing yeah. uh, on occasion. We'll say, hey, you know, you're experiencing a DDoS attack. We'll alert them just so they understand mm -hmm. what it is and then we'll mm -hmm. mitigate it for them. We yeah. do that three or four times and then the fourth or fifth time, uh, we're not gonna do that unless it's of course, uh, if it's, we're gonna mitigate it if it's hurting the yeah. network across yeah. the board, but that's typically yeah. how we approach it. And at first, like Eric, any tips or tricks, technical ones, about, you know, if you want? No. <laughs> Keeping it all the knowledge to yourself. Hey, I, uh, I, I, I can speak to, you know, your, your other page that you had up there. Um, I can tell you that from my marketing folks, they were incredibly happy about the turnkey solution. They didn't have to come up with, yeah. Yeah. you know, entire new ways of branding and selling. Uh, Creo kind of walked us through everything. I wasn't necessarily involved in that. Yeah. I'm an engineer. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I can so, tell you that from, what I heard from them, it was, it was not like anything that they had ever seen. Carrero had provided documents, how to brand it, how to sell it. Um, you know, there's just a lot of advantages to, you know, the way that they, that this system was implemented. Yeah. Uh, and I'll sing the praises of Carrero here. Uh, <laughs> Carrero made it easy, both from a go to market uh, approach, as well as working with our engineers and getting the system deployed. Uh, we still work together with our engineers. We're continuously turning up new scrubbing centers worldwide. Uh, we just had a press release about a new scrubbing center in Spain. And so we're constantly working with uh, career professionals, both on turning up of services, as well as mitigations as they come up uh, mm -hmm. and doing special uh, countermeasures as necessary to defend against some of these complex attacks. But all in all, Carrera has made it very easy and is one of the, the reasons we partner with them. Thanks, appreciate it. I can it. also echo like that. I can I can concur. You know, we went from from the time they made the decision to implement to we were selling in the same week, and Carrero provided us with all the materials we needed. So my marketing team didn't have to worry about that. We were out the door talking to customers about it. You know, three to four days after we made the decision, it was great. Um, there was a couple of questions in the uh, in the in two or three coming in from different channels here. Oh, one was um, um, specifically a, a competitive one. So I'm, I'm going to choose to pass on answering that in the public forum, but we can 
we can follow up uh, offline. But uh, one question was percentage of attacks that require an engineer to look at um, in terms of the level of automation. I don't know whether you have uh, experience of, of that, Eric, at first light um, or, I or um, yeah. I would say that of all the attacks that we see less, I mean, it's far less than 1% in one year and almost a year that we've had the system implemented one time we've had to like manually intervene yep. to figure out what was going on so i mean of the thousands of attacks that we've seen i mean we've already seen 100 gig attacks that it's mitigated and we didn't even know about it and not a single complaint so I, I, it's I'll far go. less than one percent our goal in the marketing literature, we say more than 98%, but you're right, for, in a lot of instances, it's, um, it's, it's, much, uh, it's much less than that. And the only people who see more than that might be a gaming opera, game hosting operator, you know, who are basically under multiple constant attack, 24 hours a day uh, kind of thing from very smart uh, attackers. I don't know if you, I don't know if you have a, uh, an anecdote on that uh, over at GTT, Eric. Well, I, I, I mean, obviously, from a margin perspective, the less manual intervention, the better, right? We're talking managed services, we're talking monthly recurring revenue, which, you know, businesses love. Uh, and that's why people should be interested in, in providing this type of service to customers is it provides steady, you know, revenue, growable revenue, uh, without the need for a lot of expensive man hours. And uh, anytime we do have to open tickets, uh, again, we work with Carrero on these th these issues as they arise, uh, and we usually see quite quick resolutions. But yeah, there's not a ton of those type of activities that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, while DDoS attacks can be large and complex, mm -hmm. uh, we understand them very well. GTT, as well as the other providers here, and, and Carrero, we understand them very well, know how to deal with them rather quickly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not like a high... You know, we, we have to spend a lot of time every week dealing with DDoS attacks. A lot of it happens automatically, and that's great for the, the, the return on investment. Great. Well, um, I'm respectful of everybody's time, and uh, we've, we've run a little bit longer than we planned here, but it's been great. It, uh, I, you know, I could talk all afternoon about this, and obviously we, we encourage anybody who would like mm -hmm. to know more to uh, follow up. Uh, we'll make the recording available, and obviously uh, um, we can uh, we can try and support folks who want to offer DDoS protection as a service. It's part of, it's part of Carrero's mission. Uh, we, you know, we believe everybody should have access to DDoS protection in this day and age, the way we rely on the internet. So we're very motivated to, to help our customers, a large percentage of which are providers themselves uh, deliver the protection onto to their customers. So uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for, for joining us today. It's been very interesting to hear your firsthand real world experiences. And uh, thanks uh, for the attendees uh, for joining us today too. Uh, look forward to speaking to you again soon on some other interesting topic uh, regarding DDoS. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks,